We, we have to finish up our discussion from last week about Ezra. So if you would turn to chapter 10 of Ezra. I think we left off at about verse uh, 13, maybe. Now, if you weren't here, this, these last two chapters of Ezra kind of form the whole point and purpose of Ezra. Uh, he was sent back to Jerusalem from Babylon with vast amounts of wealth for the sake of the temple and worship. But his real, his real, well, I don't want to say claim to fame, but the, the, the thing he accomplished the most when he returned back to Jerusalem was the reform of the people. Uh, God sent him right at that point because the Lord knew his people were going to sin. And they returned to the sins that ultimately led to their Babylonian captivity in the first place. Uh, they intermarried with the surrounding tribes, with the people who were now inheriting the promised land. And when they intermarried with them, they adopted the false gods of these people. So that's exactly what led to Israel's downfall before. Same sin, they learned nothing, at least some of them learned nothing. The majority of the people, however, seem to be behind Ezra this time. And they recognize this was wrong. And they know the consequences of what happened last time this sort of thing happened, and they turned to idolatry. So Ezra uh, publicly makes a show of his confession and repentance. The people see that and are shamed. And they agree, kind of grassroots movement, that something needs to be done. Uh, rather than just kind of pass sentence, they uh, actually set up kind of a court system to hear each individual case, uh, how this happened, who the, who the uh, accused are, and let them answer for themselves. So they have due process to try and deal with this sin. In verse 13, we'll pick it up. Uh, a meeting is called in Jerusalem with everybody in all of Israel. And there's you know, probably only maybe 30,000 or so present in Israel at this time, and they're all kind of settled around Jerusalem. So everybody's given three days to show up in Jerusalem. They have a national-wide meeting to address the problem. So this is where it picks it up, verse 13. Uh, but there are many people. It's the season for heavy rain, and we are not able to stand outside, nor is it the work of one or two days, for there are many of us who have transgressed in this matter. Please let the leaders of our entire congregation stand and let all those in our cities who have taken pagan wives come at appointed times together with the elders and judges of their cities until the fierce wrath of our God is turned away from us in this matter. And only Jonathan, the son of Aziel, and Jehaziah, Jehaziah the son of Tikva, opposed this and Mashalem, and Shebathai, and, uh, the Levite, gave them support. All right, so the people, the people want, uh, instead of dealing with this at this national meeting, they ask that they can all return to their own cities and that the local leaders deal with this and take their time dealing with it so everybody can answer for themselves. And we do see it's opposed by four people, uh, which is kind of gutsy. Why would anybody oppose this? Well, if you look, starting in verse 18, from verses 18, really through 44, is a list of all the offenders who had taken foreign wives. And this Mashalem guy who's mentioned as objecting to the due process in verse 15 is actually listed in verse 29 as one of the people who had taken a pagan wife. So why, why did these people object to this due process dealing with the guys who had taken foreign wives? Because they had, or their friends had, 
And they're trying to protect themselves. Does it say one of them is a Levite? It does. In fact, we'll get to that in a little bit. Verses 16 and 17 then. Then the descendants of the captivity did so, and Ezra the priest with certain heads of the father's households were set apart by the father's households, each of them by name, and they sat down on the first day of the tenth month to examine the matter. By the first day of the first month, they finished questioning all the men who had taken pagan wives. So due process was done. It took a total of three months to work through the list of everybody who had taken pagan wives. Uh, again, it wasn't a knee-jerk thing they did in dealing with them. It was deliberate due process. And then, kind of the surprising thing, 18 to, starting in verse 18 now, they actually list by name everybody in Israel who had taken a pagan wife. I mean, these guys' names now are forever etched into the history of Israel as putting Israel in jeopardy of destruction. This is, this is public shaming, you know, like no other. Uh, this would have marred them and their families for generations. You know, why do that to somebody? Why, why do you think the purpose is of listing a name down like this so it's never forgotten? Exactly. This is a big deal, and the entire nation of Israel stands at risk of being destroyed because of this. You know, last time this happened, the whole nation did it. This time around, it amounts to 110 men had taken foreign wives. And, and Ezra wants to make sure this isn't going to happen again. So, as a deterrent, they are listed by name. Uh, and people will forever remember those men so they don't become like them. And yeah, you'll notice starting in verse uh, 18, he starts, he starts with the priests. Among the sons of the priests who had taken pagan wives, the following were found. Of the sons of Jeshua, uh, of Jeshua, the son of... Zedak, Jozadak, and his brothers, and then lists four names. Uh, um, they probably repented of their sins. Yes. Uh, there's a total of 17 priests who are named by name here. And he starts with the priests. Uh, because they're the, you know, kind of the biggest public example. You know, they're, they're the ones who stand in front of the congregation and are supposed to be modeling the word of God that they're teaching, and yet they're teaching people to disobey by their actions. So they're listed first as kind of the most grievous of the bunch. Um, and, then, and then the list will go on. Verse 23 lists six um, Levites, also the Levites. So these are also temple workers. And then there's 24, the singers. You know, they, that was a special position in the church back then. That was a big deal to be in the choir. Uh, and then verse 25 to, 20, uh, to 44, it lists the others, the non-priests. So it goes through all three different categories of temple workers first. Oh, and gatekeepers, too, the, the bouncers, basically, who make sure only Jews get into the temple. So four groups of temple worshipers, temple workers, are listed first in order of importance in the church um, and held up. They're the main examples. And then we get the other ones, the non-temple workers, your average Jews, and there's a total of 86 other Israelites uh, and you see in verse 34, one family in particular is hit hard, the sons of Bani. And then it lists 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 
You know, it lists verse after verse of that one family so that that, that family really had ignored God's will. Yeah, that is what they did. They had, to, they had to send their wives away and any children that were born of the union. So the wives, uh, the, the legal, the courts back in, among the Jews, and in fact most pagan countries except for ancient Rome, I guess, um, gave the custody of the children to the mother. And so when the mothers were sent away, the children went with them. So these guys lost their families because of this. So yeah, their repentance, their, their, uh, their sign of repentance was to end the marriage. And they knew this was wrong when they did it. Mm-hmm. They did it anyway. Right, and I'm sure they had great justification because most of the people that came back from Babylon were workers to rebuild and temple workers. So they were tradesmen. So there were a lot of men, very few women. Slim pickings, you got to do something, you know. So uh, they turned to the pagans for wives. Uh, so I'm sure they, they thought that was a valid enough reason, but not in the eyes of God it wasn't. Yeah, and we see this uh, elsewhere too. You know, when uh, Hagar, Abraham's um, kind of second wife, the servant of Sarah that was given to Abraham to bear a son, when Hagar and Sarah uh, fought and Abraham sent, sent Hagar away, she took Ishmael, her son, with her. So that it was common practice all along among the Jews that the, the woman gets custody of the kids. Now, something to consider in this, though, that does apply to today, uh, where on the handout where it says verse 18 to 22 there, these, these priests are listed first because of their disobedience and because this is the most scandalous because they're supposed to be the models of faith. A question, should priests, pastors, found guilty of no, notorious public sins be allowed to continue in their ministry? Should these priests... See, we aren't told... We aren't told if the priests are allowed to continue in their ministry or not. It doesn't specifically say they could keep doing all their duties. Uh, maybe they could, I don't know. But in our day and age, if you know, a pastor gets caught in a horrible, public, scandalous sin of some sort, should he be allowed to stay in the ministry? Mm-hmm. Yes? Right. Well, this is kind of hit close to home in this circuit, too. You know, um, the whole scandal involving Iowa Falls with the previous pastor getting caught in a police sting with prostitution. Uh, there are still people who say, he should have, I mean, he publicly apologized and said it was a sin and he was sorry and he repented. There are still people today over there who say he should have been allowed to stay on as pastor because he, he repented of a sin. So, yes or no? Is that being too mean to say he shouldn't be pastor anymore? And at what point do you draw that line? Pastors are held to a higher standard. Yeah, but if he's repentant, Mm -hmm. What about a pastor who divorces? Well, he's a pastor in office. Should he stay pastor? Why not? Aren't you being mean?
Okay. What if, what if his wife committed adultery? What if it wasn't his fault? <laughs> First Timothy three one to seven. Look that one up. First Timothy three one to seven. You know, and at and at what at what point does someone's sins disqualify him from office? I'm no saint. <laughs> in terms of being sinless. I've done some terrible sins. Should I be removed? 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 specifically. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of bishop, and that word literally means pastor, he desires a good work. A bishop slash pastor then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. The last verse? What about it? He must have a good testimony of those who are outside. Right, meaning the un, those who aren't of the church. Right. Exactly. So, you know, are pastors supposed to be sinless? Well, there was only one of those ever, and that was Jesus. Every pastor is going to have failings and faults, but at, at the point where they where they compromise the ministry and lead to the possibility of someone being on the outside, being kept away from the church because his sins are so offensive, he's got to go. Uh, And the sins listed here are, you know, some of these things aren't even sins. That's right. (laughs) Not given to wine, not violent, not greedy. Uh, yeah, Paul in Corinthians did tell them that if an unbeliever leaves, you're not under obligation in such cases. Well, here's this other thing in here. You know, verse 4, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with reverence, having part of Part of that public image and, and leadership thing is supposed to be that your house is in order. Well, maybe, maybe it is. Maybe he ignored the signs. Maybe he didn't fulfill his duties as, as a husband being faithful in, in other ways. Um, I'm very much of the opinion that if a pastor gets divorced, he needs to leave office to, to, to resolve things in his own personal life. Um, even, even if he's not necessarily completely at fault. And it may very well be that he wasn't at fault, but I think he should still, at least at a minimum, leave that congregation because now the scandal is so big in that, that area that it's going to create problems for him in his future ministry there. Um, the souls of other people always have to be the first concern, not the individual pastor. pastor? Yeah. Well, if she leaves him, she has severed that to the point he can't be her God-given head anymore. She won't allow it. Um, 
again here, it does say the husband of one wife. So if, if that were to happen and say she does turn away from the faith and run off with somebody else and abandon him, should he remarry husband of one wife? And it doesn't say one wife at a time. Uh, yeah, you know, in our day, unfortunately, Synod is weak on this and doesn't take a strong stand and allows divorced pastors to continue in their ministry, uh, even some who have been divorced more than once. I, I don't think that's a healthy practice, and I don't think it's faithful to what it says there in 1 Timothy. Um, and going back to Ezra again, which is where we started with this, the priests were listed first for a reason, because they're the ones whose example had people's souls on the line. And they are listed by name, and their sins are remembered to teach lessons. Uh, so, yeah, every pastor is sinful, and every congregation has to be patient enough that it recognizes, yep, he's a human being and he sins. But when that sin rises to a level where it's a public scandal, and it's making people question whether or not that church is even faithful to Jesus, then that's the point that Timothy says a person is disqualified from office. If you don't have that good testimony on those who are outside because your sins are so public and scandalous, then for the sake of the souls of the people and the ministry in that community, you cannot be the pastor anymore. Yeah, because then, again, souls are hurt by that. People won't want to be part of that church and that teaching because if that's what they're all about, who would want to be part of that? That's right. And it does talk about things like drunkenness. You know, he's supposed to be temperate, sober-minded, good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. Not given to wine, not violent. You know, a husband who beats his wife up should not be a pastor. A husband who, a pastor who gets drunk shouldn't be a pastor. Not given greedy for money. Pastor's always worried about money and trying to get more for himself shouldn't be a pastor. Not quarrelsome if he's like starting fights and stuff shouldn't be a pastor. Not covetous. You know, it's, uh, it's for the sake of those who are uh, uh, on the outside. All right, so anyway, this is, this is a valid concern, and it does impact us in our day, and this is something congregations do have to address, and maybe someday you'll have to address that too. You are not, just, just don't let the cult of personality be the deciding factor in these matters. If ever you have to weigh something like this, weigh it in terms of 1 Timothy 3. Have, have the lines been crossed according to God's word? Not, do we really like the guy and want to give him a pass? Doesn't matter if you like the guy. Doesn't matter if you think he's the greatest pastor who ever lived. If he's crossed the lines of, of God's word, then you're not only within your rights as a congregation, you have a duty as a congregation for the sake of those who aren't part of the congregation yet to tell him he can no longer be the pastor. It's called, it's called disposal, or de deposal rather. Uh, deposing a pastor from the ministry, defrocking. Uh, and it is your duty to do so if you are ever put in that position. All right. So that's kind of where Ezra stops. You know, it's kind of a, uh, I don't know, a, a, a harsh ending. But basically, we identify by name all of those who have placed the church, Israel, in jeopardy. We've administered punishment. We've reformed the people. The end. You know, that's where Ezra cuts it off. That was kind of his whole purpose in his calling by God to come into Israel. He's the one who's going to reform the people and set the tone for the generations going forward. So he's a spiritual reformer. Uh, now, Nehemiah. First of all, any comments, any questions on anything in Ezra? All right, now to Nehemiah. Uh, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah traditionally were one book. Uh, they were divided later. 
But yeah, that was originally a single book. On the handout for Nehemiah, you see a rough timeline of when they all kind of existed there. Uh, Zerubbabel was the first governor sent by uh, Cyrus the king back to Jerusalem from Babylon to start the rebuilding. He, he built, rebuilt the temple. Gap of 57 years, then Ezra is sent. He reforms the people. Gap of 12 years, then Nehemiah is sent. Nehemiah's claim to fame will be rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. Uh, and then he returns back to Babylon. He has a very good relationship with the king, Artaxerxes. And then he's sent back again to Jerusalem. So on the handout, there are three asterisks, asterisks-i. Uh, where Ezra was a priest, Nehemiah is a layman with great leadership skills. Ezra was largely responsible for the spiritual reform of the people, while Nehemiah is, was responsible for rebuilding Jerusalem. He's kind of a city planner. Both Ezra and Nehemiah, but mostly Ezra, are credited with bringing together the books of the Old Testament into one collection, which we today know as the Old Testament. So uh, Ezra it mentioned several times, if you remember in the reading of Ezra, how he was a scholar. Uh, and how devoted he was to God's word so that even the pagan kings recognized his devotion to his God and to God's word. Uh, Ezra was more than just a scholar. He was also God's instrument to bring the Old Testament together. It was under Ezra that scriptures divided into the prophets and other writings. Uh, by, by the end of Ezra and Nehemiah, virtually the Old Testament that we have is now in place. And Israel has the entire Old Testament. So he's, he's an extremely important scholar in Scripture. Verse 1, Nehemiah. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, uh, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. All right, his, uh, his father is called Hakaliah, unknown from any other biblical reference, so he's not a, not a significant person in biblical history. Uh, it says in the month of Chislev, this is the third month of the Jewish calendar. In our calendar, it amounts roughly to November, December, late, late autumn. Uh, and he says he was in the citadel of Shushan, or Susa in other translations. Um, this is the winter residence of the Persian kings. It's a wealthy area. Um, so he's living in a royal city, and as we see, his job originally was with the king personally. So he knew the king personally. Uh, it's also in this city where the prophet Daniel had his prophecies. So it is an important city. Verse 3. Oh, Hanani, verse 2. Uh, yeah, Hanani, one of my brethren... Uncertain whether that means it's his actual brother or just a fellow Jew, since they called each other brothers. Hard to know which. Uh, but this, this person had evidently been back to the Holy Land and had come back now, and he's giving a report of what the conditions were like there. Uh, and specifically noted uh, in verse 3 now, what the issue was. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. That little note there, the walls of Jerusalem are broken down, that's going to become a huge impact on Nehemiah. Uh, and he sets it in his mind that he is going to go back and rebuild those walls. Because as long as the walls are down in Jerusalem, they are open to attack. They're in danger. And they can be wiped out again. Walls work. 
There's a lesson in there somewhere. I'm not sure where. <laughs> but they do, and they did. And Nehemiah's job was to rebuild that wall for the safety of the people. So this has a big impact. Verse 4. So it was, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Uh, shows something of Nehemiah's love for God's people, his lack of selfishness. He's genuinely hurting for his people, for God's people. Uh, Nehemiah's faith and practice is all the more astonishing considering his context. You know, he's, he's working in the middle of a pagan city that is filled with false gods. And as you'll see, he's very public about his faith. He's in misery about what's happening to his people. And he's praying constantly for God to help them. And people take notice of that. Uh, he's not at all ashamed to bear witness of his faith in the midst of his horrible, godless context. And my note there, people, have to be, people of faith have to be ready to stand alone these days, uh, as Nehemiah undoubtedly did. I'm sure he was a minority with a handful of Jews in Shushan. The majority of them, I'm sure, were were uh, Persians worshiping false gods. So it takes courage. Verse 5, And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Uh, he calls him Lord God of heaven. Specifically, the Lord God thing is important. You'll notice again how the word Lord in verse 5 is capitalized. That corresponds to the Hebrew word Yahweh. So Yahweh Elohim is the, the name of God that he calls on. Uh, it is the earliest name of God in Scripture. Yahweh appears in, in chapter 2 of Genesis. Uh, Elohim occurs 32 times in chapter 1. Uh, we, we talked about this before. The word Elohim is a plural word, masculine plural. So the name God chooses for himself is a plural, the Trinity. You know. And Yahweh is a singular. So just in that name, Yahweh Elohim, you actually have a reference to the Trinity. Singular yet plural at the same time. So he's praying to the triune God, Yahweh Elohim. Uh, you who keep your covenant. This is quite a statement of faith when you think about it too. You who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Uh, consider for a minute what God had done to his people. He let them be taken over by Nebuchadnezzar. He let the northern kingdom get wiped off the face of the earth and the southern kingdom now also be a bunch of slaves in Babylon. And yet Nehemiah talks about God as keeping his covenant. It's a tremendous statement of faith. He's not going to believe what his eyes tell him. He's going to believe what God's word says. God's word said he was going to remember his children. Nehemiah trusts that's going to happen. In fact, it was happening. There were already people going back to Jerusalem. Verse 6 and 7. Now his prayer, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father, house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. When Ezra did his act of public repentance in front of all Israel. He, too, claimed the sin as his own. Our sin is great. My sin is great. Even though he hadn't done anything wrong, per se. He hadn't taken these foreign wives. Nehemiah is doing exactly the same thing. When he's praying for forgiveness for the nation, he's including himself in this. I have broken your law. He's not pointing fingers. God saved those, those people. It's me. Chief of sinners. And one of the marks of someone of faith is, is this acceptance of guilt. This humility before God. 
that one way or another you have participated in this sin, even if you may not have been the instigator of it or the main driving force behind it. It's part of you too. So Nehemiah owns it. My sin. Even though he hadn't even been alive when Babylon was, uh, when they were carted off into Babylon. Why did he own the sin? Because it was, he was part of the people that had done this. He was, we think, we think in our terms as Americans, we, very individualistically, it's all about us as individuals. The Jews thought tribally. It was all about them as a nation and a people and God's people. So as one went, they all went. Um, and I actually, there's a, a famous speech by Martin Luther King Jr. where he's talking about well, the, the civil rights thing in the, the black community that as one of us goes, we all go. And it's, a, it's actually very insightful for how the ancient Jews thought of themselves. They were God's people. It would help us to think in the same terms. Uh, we're not little individuals and islands unto ourselves. We're part of a people of God, and as one goes, we all go. So, which means we all need to have the same concern and love for one another because as one of us goes, we all go. If somebody is suffering, we all suffer with and should be there to help. If one is happy, we all rejoice with and should genuinely be happy. So, yeah, none of this individualistic me and my private Jesus stuff they are a people together, a flock, and that's how they see themselves. One sins, they all sin. Uh, 8 and 9, remember I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations, but if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you cast out though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place that I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Um, so a prayer from God's word, actually. This is, this is Nehemiah holding God to his word. I pray the word you commanded. That, yep, if you're unfaithful, I'll scatter you, but if you return to me, I'll restore you. Uh, Luther was known for this in his prayers, too. Some people describe Luther's prayers as sounding like he was arguing with God because he would hold God to his word. You said here that you were going to help your children, that you would protect us. You know, pointing to his word, his promises. That's actually how God wants us to pray. He wants us to hold him to his word, to, to vest ourselves completely in that. You said it, I'm going to believe it, I'm going to hold you to it, because you know, you're bound to that now. So God has promised to show mercy to those who repent. Nehemiah is going to hold him to it. Now, now let's see that mercy you promised. Verse 10. Now these are your servants and your people whom you've redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Um, even while they're still in captivity. He's praying this from Babylon. Uh, even while they're still in captivity, he says, you have redeemed us. You know, these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed. He's not going to let that little business of being captives in Babylon deter him from trusting the power of God's redemption. Whether they all get to go back to Jerusalem doesn't matter. God is good for his word. He's redeemed them just like he said, even if it doesn't look like it at the time. And then verse 11, O Lord, I pray, please let these your ears be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man for I was the king's cupbearer. He's praying that God soften the heart of the king because he has something in mind that he wants to do, a request he wants to make. So he wants God to work in the heart of the king who was Artaxerxes at the time to soften his heart so he can make his request. And we'll see what that is in the next chapter. He says he was a cupbearer to the king. You wouldn't think that's a big deal, but that's an extremely important job. Uh, back in those days, one of the main ways to kill a king was poison. So the cupbearer had to drink 
the king's drink in front of him so it's not poisoned before he hands it to him. Um, the king had to trust the cupbearer with his life every day. So there was a tremendous amount of trust vested in the cupbearer. That was an important job. You literally had the king's life in your hands and he had to trust you with his life. So again, sounds like a small, unimportant thing, but that's a, it's a hugely influential position because you have the king's trust literally with his life. And in fact, all the more for Artaxerxes because his father, Xerxes, was killed by one of his uh, court attendants. So there was a family history of these court attendants killing the king. And I was told, I was told by an African once who was kind of inviting me to go over to Africa that if somebody offered me a drink, go ahead and take it, unless I see their thumb over, over the lip of the glass in the water or whatever they're passing me. Uh, because they, they say one of the tricks to poison you is they give you a cup and take a drink in it and their poison is under their nail and their thumb and then when they hand it to you, they stick the thumb in the poison and hand it to you and poison it before they give it to you. So poisoning the cup still happens. <laughs> All right, that's where it ends. Any thoughts, any comments on either Ezra or Nehemiah so far? All right, let's close with prayer. Gracious God, you have given us your word that you will care for us, that you will forgive us and redeem us, and we pray that you do fulfill your word among us this day. Grant us your grace and strengthen us for Jesus' sake. Amen.